Yes. All right, everyone. Welcome to uh, the weekly press conference with head Mizzou football coach, Eli Drinkwitz. As usual, we'll start with a uh, opening statement from coach, and then you guys know the drill. Get your hands raised, and we'll get you in the queue to ask questions. So with that, Coach, take a moment to update us on your team as we prepare for Florida. Yeah, first off, want to wish happy birthday to Charlie Cheese Harbison, who's the youngest 61-year-old man I've ever met. Uh, he's an incredible asset to our staff and, and just hope that he has a great birthday on Toughness Tuesday. Um, you know, just to recap the Kentucky game, proud of our, our football team, proud of our staff and our players for finding a way to win and establishing their will in that game. Um, played as solid as a football game in all three phases as you can play. Um, so I'm very proud of them for that. Um, but we've turned the page. Uh, we, we, are, we are solely focused on uh, Florida in this task ahead of us. It is a tremendous challenge. It's the fourth top 25 team that we're going to place in our last, first five games. I'm not sure anyone else in the country has played uh, that tough of a schedule. Um, you know, for us, Tremendous challenge. We're down to 64 scholarship players um, this week, and that really doesn't have anything to do with COVID. That has to do with uh, injuries, NCAA, transfers, opt-outs, all the different things. So, I mean, realistically, we're a class down uh, of scholarship football players, and that's really only two less than we had uh, Saturday for Kentucky. Um, so, incredibly proud of our team and players as they face that challenge uh, each week. You know, offensively, uh, where it starts for them at Florida, they have tremendous amount of talent. Obviously, they've got an outstanding head football coach who also is a play caller, uh, but they're really big and physical up front. Their lines of scrimmage, obviously, offensively, uh, they run the ball well, which establishes what they want to do and their identity, and that's always been what Coach, coach Mullen teams do, is run the football. Um, and then it allows them to create matchups uh, with uh, number one, Kadarius Tony, who is uh, Kadarius Tony, who is an outstanding football player, athlete, has really grown, was a high school quarterback at Blunt High School in Mobile, and has really developed into an outstanding playmaker for them. Um, then they they create matchups that are as creative as anybody in the country uh, for their tight end, Kyle Pitts. I mean, he is he's dynamic. Um, he's a mismatch problem for everybody in the country. Um, so. They've really got an outstanding scheme and an outstanding offense, uh, which, which is a very difficult task. You know, defensively, their defensive coordinator, Todd Grantham, is one of the best in the country. Uh, he's very multiple with what he does schematically. They, they play man. They play zone. They have all kinds of different pressures. They'll bring cats, uh, corner cats. They'll bring safeties. It feels like they're bringing people off the bench on third downs. Um, they're always uh, long and great athletes and physical up front. Uh, their D-line is as good as anybody we've played so far. Um, you know, I, there's been a lot made about the points they've given up. At no point in the Ole Miss game was that game ever in doubt. Uh, uh, I mean, it was 52 to, to, to 21, uh, you know, and they scored a couple of late touchdowns and went for two. But uh, that game was never in doubt. And really, the South Carolina game was not either. Uh, you know, they play defense that, you know, gives up first down but no explosive plays and takes time off the clock. So, I, defensively, they're really good. Forced two turnovers, which led to points in the Texas A&M game. So, got a tremendous challenge um, ahead of us and uh, got a lot of work to do today to be ready for that. So, with that, I'll open up with questions. First one's going to come from Mitchell Forty from Power Mizzou. Mitchell, go ahead. Hey, Eli, uh, you mentioned – you know, some, some injury injuries injury issues to get down to 64 scholarship players. I'm curious if, if you could give an injury report uh, as to who you know might be out this week. Yeah, I watched a press conference yesterday where there wasn't much reporting done, so I, I'll just keep mine. I'll let you all figure that out on Saturday too. So just play that game, I guess. Peter Ball from The Athletic. Peter. Yeah, Eli, what does your offense kind of do to, I guess, get the most out of a guy like Jalen Knox? Um, I think we just try to tap into his playmaking abilities and 
find unique ways to get him the football. Um, and I think that's what um, offensive football is about. It's about how do you utilize your skills, your skill players, and, and your schemes in order to get guys in space with the ball in their hand. Um, Jalen's got a really unique skill set. He runs like a running back. He's got good speed. He's got good hands. And so, you know, we're just always challenging ourselves. What are ways that we can get him on the perimeter? What are ways we can get him mismatched on uh, different DBs? And, and uh, he delivers. Max Baker from the Columbia, Missouri. And Max? Uh, Coach, on Saturday you talked about Marcus Johnson's uh, identity that he's brought. I was just wondering what that identity is that he, you know, what is that identity? Uh, Marcus has a toughness to him. He has um, a discipline to him. He has a mentality to him that shows up uh, in the way he coaches his position, the way he coaches, weight, the way he carries himself. Um, he has a standard of performance for everybody in the room, and and uh, he holds them accountable to that standard. Uh, I mean, anytime you've played uh, – in the SEC, were a captain of your team, drafted in the second round, played in the NFL, coached multiple uh, NFL linemen, developed NFL linemen. But when you start your career as a strength intern and work your way up to one of, I believe, three African-American offensive line coaches in the country, I think that says something about you as a person, uh, your commitment and your toughness. Um, and um, so incredibly proud of him and, and who he is and really fortunate he's on our staff. Suichi Tirada from the Kansas City Star. Go ahead. Eli, I know you mentioned Kyle Fitz a bit, but what kind of challenges does it pose when, when it's a tight end and just how, you know, how much they can do in an offense? Yeah, I mean, they split him out uh, where, he, you know, they use him like an NFL, and, and I think that's why you hear so much about, you know, Coach Mullen eventually being a uh, head coach in the NFL because of the way he utilizes his players, you know, he utilizes uh, Pitts like they do Kittle and like they do Travis Kelsey and, and some of the other great ones where they, you know, line them up single receiver to the weak side and, and create four by ones and make you, you know, isolating with no underneath coverage. They, they, they do a good job of getting him matched up on Mike linebackers over the middle of the field. Uh, I mean, I, I saw it earlier. I think he had 175 yards and four touchdowns versus Ole Miss. So, I mean, they use him all kinds of ways. Andy Humphrey from KTGR. Yeah, Eli, uh, last week you said that you didn't want to put too many things in front of Connor as, you know, as he learns the scheme and, and, and with decision-making and whatnot. Curious as to what you thought uh, after watching the tape uh, from Kentucky uh, about how you would evaluate his decision-making in that game and how he's grasping what you want out of him going forward. I think he did an outstanding job on third downs. Uh, he, he was incredibly efficient on third downs and finding the right decisions and taking off running when he needed to. There was one decision on third down that I disagreed with. And then, in the, uh, you know, on base downs, there was two uh, really crucial plays that, it, that I wish he could have had back. Um, you know, the, the issue is when you're a quarterback, you know, those three plays can be the difference in the game. And so – it's not like you can make a, you know, a 90 on the test and still win the game. You know, I mean, and those those plays, you know, you get 80, you know, for us, we had 92 plays. Three of them can be the difference in the game. So he's got to continue to improve and he knows that. And, and that's the thing I love about him is he is he is always trying to get better. You know, he he, he knew it before uh, I could even start coaching him on the sideline about, yeah, I got to run and get that first down. So, you know, incredibly proud of him for that, but he's still got a long way to go. and. I got a long way to go as far as coaching him and, and uh, improving as a football coach that I can relate to him and get him better. Soren Petro, go ahead. Uh, coach, uh, early on, I, I know there's a, a tight fraternity amongst coaches, right? So I'm going to ask this in a, in a general term. Early on, you were uh, the first coach that I saw that uh, took your players down and got them registered to vote. Uh, you've also been very outspoken in saying, hey, there's a pandemic going on. There are things that are more important than football. We hear coaches say that a lot uh, in regard to their, you know, to the players, maybe somewhat, some people would say it's a sales pitch to mom and dad and to the players to get into the program, but you, you've actually backed that up. I'm just curious, what's, what's your opinion of how uh, the rest of the coaching fraternity has done as far as these subjects matter, uh, subject matters go? I mean, we're, we're headed towards an election and, you yeah. know, you guys are going through the pandemic. What, what do you think about how your fraternity's done? 
you know, I don't know that it's, uh, I don't know that I have enough collateral within the fraternity to try to make comments on the overall state of college football coaches. I'm, I'm pretty young in this profession. I will say that I'm very proud of the SEC. I, I do think that when we first started um, working on social justice issues, you know, we had uh, Zoom calls as SEC head coaches, and I believe all of us have, have initiated a voter registration uh, opportunity for our entire team. I know that we all supported uh, making sure that our teams had the ability to vote on Tuesday, and I think it's been, um, you know, a powerful thing uh, for our conference. Uh, but you know, I honestly I haven't looked around the rest of the country or, or kept track with what everybody else is doing. Um, but uh, I am proud of what we are doing in the SEC. Dave Matter from the St. Louis Post. Dave. Hey Eli, when maybe this is kind of becoming routine at this point, but when you're playing a team that's had a bunch of players in quarantine, is it a bit of a guessing game or do you just go in expecting everyone to be available at, at this point? Yeah, I don't really worry about it. There's no way that uh, – there's no way to know, as we know in the SEC, because there's no way to know. So you just go in assuming they'll be at full strength. And, and um, you know, we know the challenges we have. Um, we know what kind of schemes they're going to try to run, and then we'll adjust while we're, you know, in the game. But I don't think we're going to act like, the, you know, they're not going to have their best guys. They're going to be ready. They're going to be prepared. They've been – watching our tape for two weeks that they're going to know our tendencies they're going to know our what we like to do so we're going to have to go out there and play a mistake-free football game and and play above our ability to have a chance to win ben arnett from komu ben so it's kind of on that similar subject um how has preparation for this game changed or, or been different considering the schedule change they haven't played for a while don't have a recent game on tape that kind of stuff um, it really hasn't changed oh, for us. We're we're into our normal game week. Uh, you know, we were a little bit ahead. We spent um, at least, you know, Wednesday afternoon and Thursday of the bye week as a coaching staff game planning for the Florida game before that got rearranged. Um, so, you know, we may have been a couple of days ahead. But, you know, starting on Sunday night, we watched Florida and for us offensively, we started from scratch rebuilding the game plan and trying to figure out, you know, what what we can do based off who's going to be available for us and what strengths those guys possess versus what they do defensively and, and work in the chess match. So we'll see. Gabe DeArmond, go ahead. Yeah, Eli, with uh, with Damon Hazleton missing a little bit of time and then, uh, you know, last week on the depth chart, he was a little bit lower than he had been. Were you happy with how he responded? He was active, especially very early in that game. Yeah, I believe he started the game. That's the first catch of the game. Um, so, I thought he played well. I think he, you know, uh, working back into shape, I, I think he had somewhere between 35 plays and, and made the most of those and, and played well in the perimeter and, I was proud of the way he played. I was really proud of the way the entire wide receiver core played. And, and uh, so, yeah. Mitchell, 40. Well, you said after the game that, that Larry Roundtree can, I think you said, take a butt chewing. Um, yeah. How rare is it to find a player who has, you know, the ability to, to, to have the humility to be coached or to be coachable, but also kind of the, the mindset and the willingness to handle a workload like 37 carries? It's rare. That's what makes uh, Larry elite. Um, you know, I think there's times when we get into to these situations and you recruit kids for so long um, that they forget that the moment they step foot on campus, they got to continue to work to improve. And, you know, there's got to be a humility in being coached and being coachable and understanding that in order to become the best version of yourself, you have to allow people to have constructive criticism. And it's not always going to be roses and, and uh, pie in the sky and balloons. There's going to be some tough conversations, and this is where your weakness – and nobody likes to hear about their weaknesses. Everybody just would prefer to have their graphics put up on, you know, social media all day. But the reality of it is that when you want to improve, you have to improve your weaknesses. And, and you got to look at your weaknesses and say, how do I make these – how do I build these up? And uh, Larry's willing to do that. And his parents have done an outstanding job raising – I don't think there's a better smile. Uh, I mean, he's got an outstanding smile. He's got a great charisma about him. Um, you know, the only negative he has is he's not very good at comparisons. You know, I mean, 
he struggled comparing linebackers. I think he was trying to say my, uh, Brian Erlacher. Um, you know, so we got, we got to work with him on his comparisons. You know, we talk about not having those, but uh, other than that, you know, he'll take that chewing today. But other than that, he's good. Kyle Pinnell from the Maneater. Go ahead. Hi, Coach. Over the past few weeks, you guys have won games by scoring 45 and 20 points. Um, as a coach, um, what are, are – how do you prepare for, like, are there differences between a low-scoring game or what you project to be a low-scoring game versus high-scoring game? And then kind of what are – or what does it say about this team to be able to play two contrasting styles of games and come out with wins both times? I mean, to me, that's that's the mark of a, a team, and that's the mark of coaching. Um, each game is different, and, and, and the teams that can adjust their style in order to find a way to win are the teams that usually are the most successful. Uh, when you get stuck in one style, uh, then people can find ways. You know, they know exactly what to do to beat you for us. We're able to win in multiple ways, um, you know, and I think it's, it has the ability to play off each other. You know, when the defense is playing really well, you know, offensively, you don't need to take as many chances. You don't want to put them in a bad position with turnovers like we had previous week. Previous week, you know, we had put them in bad positions with turnovers and needed to make up the ground that we were giving up, you know. And so uh, it's just one of those deals where it kind of goes back and forth. And, and going into the game, you know, we always go over our keys to victory on on uh, Tuesday for each side of the ball and special teams and focus on specifically what we need to do in order to give us the best chance to win. And, uh, you know, we knew that, that uh, the way the style of play that Kentucky had, you know, this was a way that we, we felt like we could effectively execute and beat them. And so that's what we did. Eric Blum from the Columbia Daily Tribune. Eric. Eli, on Saturday, Nick Bolton told us that he thinks Josh Bledsoe plays maybe the hardest but maybe the most rewarding position on the defense. Do you think that's an apt statement? I know, I know you don't want to speak for your players, but do you think that's an apt statement? And if so, what, what makes the position that Josh Bledsoe plays the hardest but yet the most rewarding? Um, I definitely concur with, with Nick that it is a very difficult position the way we play it uh, what, and what we do defensively, just the amount of communication the amount of different techniques that he has to have, the amount of times that he's placed in one-on-one -on -one situations, uh, usually versus their fastest player, best player, and, and knows that he's going to be the person that they attack. And, and uh, you know, he handles it well. He's got a short memory. Um, you know, he, he, he's obviously really good when, when the football's coming at him. That, that play he made to, to seal the win with the, with the turnover was incredible play. And um, so I definitely agree that he plays a very difficult position. But I'll say this, anybody that plays football plays difficult positions. There's not one that's, you know, necessarily an easy job. Um, they're, they're all difficult. But his is his definitely gets uh, put on Sports Center if he doesn't do it right. Greg Palermo, go ahead. Yeah, Coach, you touched on this with, with Ben uh, a little earlier. I, and I won't suggest that anyone ever overlooks – uh, the the next opponent, but um, has this environment forced you as a staff to kind of uh, not look ahead, but uh, but be aware of uh, the fact that you could have a schedule change come up on you pretty quickly, and that you need to quickly game plan and prepare for an opponent that you didn't expect to face that next week. I think twenty twenty in general has taught us to be able to adjust and. I think it was right before our first staff meeting of the, the walkthroughs, I said the key word for our staff would be flexibility uh, and being able to adjust based off of whatever the circumstance, circumstances that are presented to us. And uh, we've, we've been able to do that. I mean, it's snowing uh, yesterday in Columbia, and uh, we'll be playing in 80-degree weather on Saturday. So the reality of it is it's all up in the air, and you do the best you can with the information you have. And, you know, I think one thing that our staff's – and our team has done a really good job of is not spending a whole lot of time sitting around speculating. You know, we're not sitting around the coffee pot speculating about what's next or what's going to happen. We're just focused on our task. You know, we've got a problem. All right, let's fix it. we got a job to do. Let's do it. And uh, I think that's helped us be successful. Jack Sobel from the Maneater. Jack. Hey, Coach. So you talked about Jalen Knox a little bit before, but uh, a big way you guys have used him is in that pre-snap motion. What is that Jet Norbit motion, whether it's with Jalen, Tyler, whoever, do for your offense? Um, uh, I mean, sometimes it can give you a number count depending on what how they rotate the safeties. Uh, sometimes it can give you a speed advantage on the edge if they're not they're going to bounce. 
Um, it causes the defense to have to communicate whether or not, again, they're going to rock and roll safeties, whether they're going to bounce gaps. Um, you know, so I, I think it's more about causing the defense disruption and giving us an opportunity to uh, create a soft edge. And if they overplay the edge, then then counter them. So it just kind of goes into our OODA loop thinking. Andrew Kaufman, go ahead. Hey, Coach, uh, how did you inform Reese Massey that he was dismissed? And I guess what, what's your policy? Is it when case by case on, on arrests versus getting dismissed? Um, how, how are you handling arrests and, and who gets dismissed and who gets to stay on the team? Yeah. Um, Maurice Massey opted out of the football season, um, and, uh, you know, I think an unintended consequences of the opt-outs, you know, I have not had contact with Maurice since he opted out. He hasn't been in our building. Um, he's only been access to, to tutoring and trying to stay in, in charge of his academics. It's part of the condition for opt-out. You still have to maintain good standing with uh, the university and, and in your uh, personal life, obviously. Uh, disappointing situation for him to be in. Um, just felt like it was in the best interest of our program to move on based on the violation of the opt-out. Um, and so each situation is uh, handled differently. Um, there's no hard and fast rule. We, we really have two rules in our program. Number one, to be on time. And number two, the team, the team, the team comes first. And um, we operate under those two rules. And, and um, so that's what we did. Wish, wish, uh, all the best in, in whatever the situation is for him. Suichi Tirada from the Star. Go ahead. Hey, Eli, two-parter. I guess first one is, do you have any updates on COVID situation? Is this still knock on wood? And two, um, are, are you guys going to change anything travel-wise? It seemed like in the Tennessee game, maybe some contact tracing was, was kind of a struggle um, once you guys got back COVID tests. We're good. Uh, but again, we tested this morning, so I, I never, uh, I mean, I always hesitate to give out information. You test three times a week. You know, somebody asked me about, I think it was, I think it was my brother Sunday morning at breakfast about, you know, do I, do I anticipate being available this week? I said, well, we have our first test Sunday and then we have another test Tuesday and then we have another test Thursday. So until Thursdays or Friday morning, I got a text at 1.26 a.m. on Friday morning that told me the results last time. So until I get that text, I don't, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. As far as traveling goes, um, we, are, we will do the absolute best we possibly can. But when you put, uh, you know, over 120 people in an organization on an airplane, there's not a lot of ways out of contact tracing. Um, so unless we can get everybody a private plane, we're going to have to live with the consequences. If, if somebody gets it, there's going to be contact tracing. We all wear masks. We all do what we're supposed to do. Uh, we will expand our rooming list um, to try to accommodate um, less people um, paired up. But again, th that gets into being expensive and all kinds of things. So we will do the absolute very best we can, and we have learned. But, uh, you know, again, I haven't been to this stadium before. I'm not sure what the visitor's locker room set up is that's always a tremendous challenge when you travel into visitors locker rooms and you put that many people in small areas there's no uh, uniform policy like there is in the nfl about the requirements for visitors locker rooms some people brag about you know how bad theirs are you know i think it's in most day and age that would be fine but in covid that's a that's a real challenge we'll do the very best we can um so it is what it is dennis dodd go ahead Hey, Eli, um, I might have missed it, but are you uh, intending on doing anything special next Tuesday for Election Day? I know you've done so much. I just wanted to catch up. No, uh, I know that, you know, the uh, Mizzou Arena is going to be one of the largest polling places okay. in the state of North Carolina or sorry, in the state of Missouri. And uh, we're very excited about that. But because of the NCA rule, we cannot have any organized team activities. So therefore, we can't all meet and go together or do anything like that. So. Uh, the players will be off Tuesday. We will encourage them to vote. I know they're all registered to vote. Uh, our staff will have the ability to go vote. You know, we will uh, obviously be, uh, you know, excited for that. But there's no organized team activities due to NCAA rules.
Um, just a point of order. I, I I did have that question for the NCAA, and they said you could take players to a polling place to vote. That and that was the, that was the interview. Yeah. Could we have a walkthrough before? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's good news. Well, then we can meet them up here and walk them up to the uh, arena. That'd be great. Uh, so, seriously, so we can? Yeah, because that, that's the question I had. It was like, it says countable athletic activity. And I said, so what does that even mean? They put out a statement today, at least to us, that said that what well, you can load them on a bus and take them to a polling place. Just Because well, that's not an athletic activity. Right? Yeah, so what they're saying is rare hours. So there's a the difference between CARA hours, countable athletic uh, related activities, and then RARA, which is like team building and stuff like that. And I yeah. guess what they're saying is as long as it's not so great. Yeah. Well, we'll look into that then. I appreciate yeah. the hook up. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm, I would put the pressure on you. I just, that's what they said. Good luck. Well, you know, the, the you know, the NCAA, they, they, they're very, uh, <laughs> they're very black and white. There's never any gray area with them. Yeah. So. yeah I, 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 I do. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Sir and Petro, go ahead. Uh, Coach, I'm curious, uh, with your quarterback, just overall philosophy, when you've got a young quarterback, are you, is there kind of a mindset of, like, throw everything at him, throw him into the deep end and let him kind of figure it out? Or or do you do it in pieces to where we're going to watch his game and, and what he has out there grow uh, week by week, year by year? Um, I don't subscribe to the, the philosophy of throwing him out there and let him sink or swim. I, I think football – in general, but specifically the quarterback position is about confidence and having confidence. And once you lose confidence or get shaky, it's tough to recover. You can't doubt yourself as a player. Um, and if you ever start doubting yourself, that's when things are not good. So we try to help identify what his strengths are. Now, there's always going to be some certain level of, of struggle. There's certain level of, okay, I've still got to improve at this area. But we try to figure out what are the strengths are, build around their strengths, and then let them develop, identify the weaknesses, you know, play to your strengths, uh, identify your weaknesses and try to improve those. With our quarterbacks, that you know, no different than our team. That's what we try to do, identify what our strengths are and then play to those strengths, um, you know. So, uh, no, we don't have the entire system in. We don't call plays that, that our quarterback's not comfortable in. Um, you know, every Monday when I get finished with the ready list, I, I show it to Connor and say, okay, what do you not feel comfortable with? And I don't like this, this or this on, th you know, Wednesdays when we're done with third downs. What do you like? What do you not like? Hey, I don't like this. Take it out. It doesn't matter if I like it. It matters if he likes it and can execute it. And, and uh, you know, I think I've been doing that since I was coaching seventh grade football. I don't know if that's unique. I doubt it is. I just, it's not about the plays that we call. It's about the plays that we can execute. And the way you execute plays is your players having confidence in themselves that they can do it and they have confidence in their teammates that they're going to execute them. Got time for two more. Dave Matter from the Post. Go ahead. Eli, when you, when you got this job and you kind of figured out what your roster was and you see that you've got a running back who has gone for 1,200 yards in this league, is there kind of a sense of comfort there in knowing that you've got a guy like Larry who's done it at this level? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, knowing Larry has the ability to rush for that many yards obviously is a great thing. Uh, for us offensively, we're always going to be predicated on running the football, so that's a, that's a huge plus. But I do think that Tyler Beatty is an incredible aspect of what Larry's been able to do because he does come in and provide a different type of runner, uh, which keeps the defense off balance, and he also creates uh, openings in the past game. Um, and so I think that one-two punch has really been the difference for us the last two games that I maybe didn't utilize well enough in the first two games um, that's given us some, you know, more effectiveness offensively. And we've got to continue to find ways to keep uh, – to give Tyler some of those carries. Uh, I love the fact that, that Larry carried it 37 times or 30 something times, but uh, we need to get Tyler a few more touches because well, he, he made some really good runs too. Last one comes from Jack Sobel. Jack? The man eater. Uh, yeah, I, and, and Ennis Rakestraw was, was the man in coverage on Kentucky's t touchdown and judging by what he posted on Twitter after the game, just who he is in general, he seems determined to learn from it, let it motivate him. Uh, what was your message to him after the game? I didn't know what he put it anything on Twitter, uh, so I have no idea about that part of it. My message to him was when we win, we sing, um, you know, celebrate the win. Um, 
you know, I know that on Sunday we, we looked at the tape, figured out what we did wrong, figure out, you know, what technique or fundamental t- can we improve on? Where are, where do our eyes, our eyes need to be? I believe he was back pedaling off the snap, uh, you know, which put him in a bad position on the out and up because uh, he wasn't in position to key his key um, and also wasn't in position to transition uh, through the break. Uh, you know, we know that we need to transition to the outside of the break on that outbreaking route. And if he turns it up, make a collision, hopefully they don't call it. And, you know, and if they do, then we give up a 15 yard penalty instead of a touchdown. So, We've got one of the mo- you know most dynamic coaching staffs as far as our back end with Coach Walters, Coach Gibbs, and Coach Harbison and Coach Gibbs' ability. You know he's coached a lot of NFL players. He's coached the NFL, and I have full confidence that he coached him up on those specific techniques. And so, yeah, that's all we said. All right, we'll let Coach go with that one. Thanks, guys. Thank you.